am so fortunate to get to introduce our speakers this evening. Timothy Patrick McCarthy is an award-winning scholar, educator, and activist who has taught at Harvard University since 1998. At the Harvard Graduate School of Education, he is core faculty in the Equity and Opportunity Foundations curriculum and the online master's program in education leadership. At the John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he was the first openly gay faculty member and still teaches the school's only course on LGBTQ plus matters, he is faculty associate at the Center for Public Leadership and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. He is also faculty co-chair for the Communicating for Impact Executive Education Program at Harvard Business School and scholar in residence on leadership and communication at Thayer Academy. Skyler Bailar is an educator, author, and advocate. He is also the first transgender athlete to compete in any sport on an NCAA Division I men's team. Skyler's exemplary work has earned him numerous honors, including NYC Pride Grand Marshal, the Out 100, LGBTQ Plus Nation's Instagram Advocate of the Year, and the Harvard Varsity Directors Award. In addition to being one of the top LGBTQ plus educators and advocates, Skylar is a leading DEI speaker and advisor who has been featured in countless media outlets. Skylar also hosts the hit podcast, Dear Skylar, on gender and culture, and is the creator of the groundbreaking LaneChanger.com gender literacy online learning series. He holds a degree in cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary psychology from Harvard and works in four research labs focusing in clinical psychology and public health. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Skylar and Timothy to the stage. Fired up crowd here tonight. Skylar Baylor. And uh, we've decided that Skylar's going to get us started tonight with a little reading from the book, and then we're going to launch into a conversation, and then we will hear some questions from the audience. So Skylar, take us away. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited that y'all are here. Um, before I start, though, I wanted to take a quick moment of silence uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, so there's been many people that we've lost recently. Um, we continue to lose trans lives. Just this morning, uh, one of my friends lost one of their friends um, uh, to transphobia. So I, I just wanna take a moment for, for those lives that we've lost, specifically trans women of color that have been brutalized and continue to be brutalized, um, as well as those lost in the, in the bombing of the Gaza hospital and all the other innocent lives that we've also lost. So join me in a moment of silence before So um, the introduction is titled, I am just who I am. We walk out one at a time, in alphabetical order. My last name begins with B, so I am first. I can feel my heart beating in my ears, the sound held inside my head by my silicone cap, a little echo chamber. From Washington, DC, freshman Skyler Baylor, the, the announcer booms. I know everyone is watching me. I've known I've done this a thousand times before, but this time is different. Underneath my crimson warm-ups, there is no longer a one-piece swimsuit that women usually wear. Instead, I'm wearing a tiny little Speedo. I am now on the men's team. Hundreds of articles have been published about my switching from the women's to the men's team. Transgender swimmer, they all write. Some attack me for my history, saying I'll never be a real man. Others say my history of an eating disorder means I'm just a deluded woman with body issues. Many claim there is no way I could keep up with, much less beat other men. From beautiful, competitive woman to mediocre, ugly man, one commenter wrote on a national profile about me. As I stand by the edge of the pool waiting for the rest of my teammates to join me, I'm 15 again, standing in my women's swimsuit behind the blocks with three girls from my relay. I remember the confidence, the feeling of knowing I could do exactly what I had set out to do, I remember the rush of the natatorium going silent as I put my hand over my heart, my pre-meet ritual, my fingers and thumbs straddling my swimsuit strap on my shoulder. 
I had done this at the start of every single meet during the singing of the national anthem. I remember staring out at the pool as the music ended, and I took a deep breath, imagining the final stroke of my race. I take a deep breath now, staring out at the pool as a D1 college swimmer. Everything feels so different. I've never stood alongside 38 college guys before. I'm at a pool I've never raced in, and it feels like all eyes are on me. But as always, the water resembles beautiful blue glass, and I breathe a sigh of relief. This is different, but it is also the same. The same 25-yard pool, the same 100-yard breaststroke race, the same breaststroke I've done since before I could remember, the same echoing acoustics that make hearing so difficult, the same chlorinated air that makes everyone cough, the same take your mark whoop, before we launch off the blocks. It's all the same. When the team is gathered along the edge of the pool, the natatorium silences. We stand in identical clothing, the anticipation dancing in my fingertips. When I am this nervous, the most nervous, I imagine my blood is rushing through my veins like white water rapids. When the Star Spangled Banner begins to play, I instinctively begin my pre-meet ritual. But this time, my fingers seeking my shoulder strap find nothing. In that moment, I realize that while everything is the same, it's also brand new. For the first time in my life, I'm competing as just myself. Without the baggage of who everybody told me to be, who everybody said I was, who I thought I was supposed to be. Today, I am just who I am. I am Skylar. My eyes well with tears, more than 19 years of stumbling to get here. Just a few months ago, I was ready to quit swimming. A year ago, I was ready to quit the world and life altogether. But today, I am standing tall, a proud Korean-American queer transgender swimmer on Harvard Men's Swimming Dive the first openly trans transgender athlete to compete for any D1 men's team in the NCAA. Of course, surviving my first meet and not getting last, important, did not mean that everything was easy from then on. It would take my teammates the rest of the year to consistently gender me correctly. It would take me nearly three years to feel comfortable around them. And all the years since I came out are still not enough to dispel all the hatred and bigotry about transgender people especially in athletics. Over the next four years, I not only become the first, and at the time, only transgender athlete to have competed for the team that aligns with their gender identity for all four collegiate seasons, but I also become, became a well-respected educator on trans inclusion. I never knew where this journey would take me when I began. The first speech I gave was at my own high school. The night before, I was awake until two or three in the morning attempting to write the speech itself, Dozens of drafts in the trash. I had no idea what I had no idea what other people would want from me. What should I tell them? What could they possibly learn from me? The speech was better received than I'd expected. Some students even said it was the best assembly they'd experienced. So as word spread, one speech led to another, and by sophomore year, speaking was the primary way I spent my free time. By graduation, 102 speeches were in the books. One of those speeches was with Tim. Despite regular assurances that what I had to say was valuable to others, I often found myself perplexed over why people wanted to listen. I was just a college swim kid who wanted to swim. When news outlets would call me advocate or activist, I used to tell them no. You only think I'm an activist, I insisted, because I am a transgender swimmer and I'm talking about it. Before every single speech, I wondered to myself, why are they here? Why do they care? Only rarely was the answer clear. I was talking to a group of swimmers or trans folks like me, we were comrades. But most of the time I spoke to people with whom I had little to nothing in common, or so it appeared. I tried to imagine the perspectives of the audience members, the students, coaches, administrators, teachers, mental health professionals, medical providers, or employees at a bank. How could I connect with them? Because in the end, the inability to connect is what breeds hatred and bigotry. That is, connection is the essence of our humanity itself. At a small school in northern Vermont, I gave a speech to a room filled with student athletes. It was a standard event. I shared my story and provided training on transliteracy before opening for questions. After, a group of students gathered in a line waiting to talk to me. A young man approached and explained he was on the wrestling team. He said, you know, before I came here and met you today, he paused. I nodded and waited. Before I met you, he began, I was nervous about people like you. 
my girlfriend's best friend is bisexual, and that used to make me uncomfortable. I'm not homophobic or anything, but I didn't want to hang out with her. <laughs> he stared at the floor, then glanced back at me as he admitted this. I didn't say anything yet. I wasn't sure where this was going. But now I've met you, and you're just like me. We are both just athletes. We're just guys. He looked directly at me now. So now, I understand. I'd begun to smile, relieved. At another speech at a high school in Pittsburgh, the audience was mostly students from local public schools, GSAs, Gender and Sexuality Alliance Clubs, with the exception of a few athletes. At the end, two football players accompanied the GSA officers to the stage to give me a small gift. One asked if he could say something to the audience. Not knowing what he would say, I nervously agreed. Listen, before I came in, I was uncomfortable, he said into the mic. You know, I can't do this, I can't speak, I just want to sit over there and stay quiet. But when I came in, it was a very inviting environment. I was like, oh, I can do this, there ain't no difference. You know, we're all the same. He then turned to me and continued, and I want to say thank you to you for opening up my eyes to a brighter future. The audience's applause almost drowned out his voice as he finished. This is reality, this is life. I just about cried. Really, I had to try very hard not to fall on stage, and while this is still one of the most touching moments I've ever experienced at a speech, such unexpected empathy has not been unique in my career. Moments like this happen over and over again. People thinking that they would find themselves uncomfortable around me, a transgender person, but then meeting me and learning I am also just someone living my life like them. These moments serve as resounding reminders of the power of empathy and shared humanity. That there is so much, there is so much more love than we might imagine, for us queer and trans folks, or for anyone, really. For time, I'm gonna just I'm gonna skip a couple pages. Um, in 2021 and 20, sorry, in 2020 and 2021, record-breaking numbers of anti-trans legislation were introduced in state governments around the United States. Most of these bills focused on two arenas. First, banning transgender athletes from competing in sports teams aligned with their gender identity, and second, banning children from accessing gender-affirming and life-saving health care. States also introduced bans forcing teachers to out their trans students, bills banning LGBTQ plus educational content in schools, and bills banning students from using bathrooms aligned with their identity. The following two years, 22 and 23, have only seen worse. With each editing pass of this book, the legislative bans are increasing exponentially and in severity, including a comprehensive overview of every tack was Im impossible. At the final stage of editing, this is the final state of editing. 491 anti-trans bills was what I wrote. 501 is the new update, all right? Anti-trans rhetoric and anti-trans violence have reached an all-time high, fueled by the media and politicians demonizing trans people and transness. Every year has become more savage than the last, 2021 and 20, 2021 being the deadliest year on record for anti-trans violence. Although anti-trans rhetoric has claimed anti-trans legislation to be protecting children or protecting women, the transphobia has grown increasingly brazen and conspicuous, shedding this disguise of alleged protection. In 2023, Daily Wire commenter, commentator Michael Knowles, he, him, said it loud and clear. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every level. After I graduated from college, I went on a speaking tour. It was a busy few weeks. I gave 43 speeches in 39 days in 26 cities, yes, we counted, um, all around the United States. The majority of these events were in red cities and red states. I wanted to bring transgender awareness to places that would not otherwise have access. While I was very excited to meet new people and continue this work, I was also very nervous. I have spent most of my life in very liberal cities, DC, New York, Seattle, Boston, Traveling to remote and rural areas of Kansas, Illinois, and Western Pennsylvania was daunting. I wasn't sure if I would be able to connect with people in such unfamiliar settings. At one such speech, I was with a group of athletes and community members at a university in a small town in Kansas. When it came time for questions, an older lady in a purple shawl asked, what do, um, what do people like me, she hesitated, clearly nervous, I don't know what the right words. I, I don't want to. I don't want to mess up. That's okay. I'd encouraged her. Let's work through it together. Okay. She took a breath. 
what do people like me, she tried again, do to help people like you? She finally finished. I smiled. This is a wonderful question, I said. What you're asking is how to be the best ally. An ally is someone who's not gay or lesbian or transgender, so not LGBTQ+, but who supports us and wants to help. The lady beamed, and before I could continue to answer her question, she interrupted. Thank you so much. Oh, isn't this wonderful? You've given me a new word, ally. I want to be an ally. That woman in purple and so many more like her is exactly why I'm a firm believer that most people are good people. Some people just need a little help finding the right words, trans or not. Of course, finding those right words is no panacea for the horrible, often violent discrimination trans people experience, but it is most certainly a step in the right direction, the first step towards connection. So whether you're trans like me or not, I hope this book helps you find ways to connect first with yourself and then with others. After all, connection is the essence of our humanity. I needed that this week, and how much clearly people in this room needed that. Um, let me just be, uh, I said this to backstage, but let me just say, welcome back. Thank you. It's been, um, it's been an honor, really. It's an honor to have, have you ask me to be here with you tonight. You came back to Harvard to launch a book tour. And we, we saw each other again last spring at the Lavender graduation where you yeah. gave a brilliant keynote speech and I was there celebrating my students. And, and getting an award. Yeah, a little bit of it. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and you asked me that. You said, hey, you know, I'm doing this book tour. This book coming out. You talked about it. And I was thinking as I was coming over here tonight about, you know, what an honor it's been to watch your journey. That one of my classmates who is friends with your parents told me about you when you were in high school, when you were coming here, and said, you know, look out. Skyler. And so I had my eyes on you from the minute you got here, and it's been wonderful to, to be part of that journey, to watch it, and to see what you and who you have become. Uh, it's extraordinary for our movement, and for our community, and for our country, and the world. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, it's an honor that you decided to do this with me. Thank you. So I wanted to ask, and I always ask my students to figure out how they are going to answer the why question, right? The why question behind the who, and the what, and the where, and the when, and the how. The why question that gets at our values, the things that drive us, the inspirations that fuel our aspirations. And so I'm wondering about this book. Why you? Why this? Why now? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go with the opposite direction. Why now? We have a, a massive amount of attention, right, on trans people right now, and specifically on gender. Um, and, and despite the fact that everybody's talking about trans people, debating where we belong, debating our rights in bathrooms or sports or schools or healthcare or what have you, none of the issues actually are about trans people because all of the science supports us. So there's a bigger problem in, in this conversation that we're not paying attention to. And we need to actually break that open and look at the systemic powers, right, the systemic oppression really, that's fueling all of this anti-trans rhetoric, that's fueling a whole lot of other anti, really anybody who isn't a cisgender, straight, white man rhetoric, right? Um, so that's the why now, right? And, and this conversation has been building for a long time, but we're at a, a very pivotal moment right now. Um, why this? Why this? Why now? Those are kind of the same. I think I did both those. Okay, so the why me? Um, you know, I've spent a long time doing this education work from my own experience, and I think, uh, especially as a trans athlete, there's, there's not actually that many of us, despite the fact that the world wants to think we're dominating sports. <laughs> most of you can't name it, probably more than two trans athletes. Uh, maybe you can name me, hopefully, now that you've met me. Um, and then maybe you can name maybe Leah Thomas, maybe some of you know Laurel Hubbard. Actually, did anybody? Who knows Laurel Hubbard? All right, that's still like five people. Okay, cool. So my point is that, you know, well, there's a lot of focus on trans athletes, and not a lot of people are speaking from experience or from expertise, um, and I, I've tried to do both as much as possible. Um, and I, I really have tried in my work to interface with as much community as I can, as well as a, as much um, non-community. And you and I talked about this backstage as well, but most of the work that I've done has been talking with not trans people, with not community members, and learning how to get these ideas across. And the reason that I feel effective in doing that is actually a lot predicated on my privilege. And this is something that I write about in the book, but I have the privilege of a Harvard degree, and people listen to me because of that. 
I also have the privilege of going to therapy, I have the privilege of supportive family and, and friends, um, and all of these allow me a groundedness that, that actually permit me to have these conversations and um, be patient with people that maybe other people might not, or they don't want to, and I both want to and feel I have the energy to do so. So there was a bit of a, a responsibility I felt as well to write this book. Yeah, love that, love that. One of the things that I was struck by reading the book is the way that you talk so powerfully about the importance of language, the language of pronouns, the language of, of identities, of lived experiences. And you, you also talk about how a lot of people get the language wrong and how the language indeed is shifting, right? Well, I mean, you talked about the final edit, right? There's still things that you need to, to edit. We all do, and I struggle with that with my own writing. And so thinking about language and how important it is, particularly around gender identity and gender experience, um, how do you have the patience for the folks who get it wrong, how, for whatever reason, and then how do you help people understand how to get it right when we are really existing and living in this shifting moment. Absolutely. So I think being being an ally or being committed to advocating for a community you're not a part of doesn't mean getting it right all the time. In fact, I think it means almost exactly the opposite. It's committing to getting it wrong sometimes and sticking with it anyways. Right? We're gonna misgender people, we're gonna use the wrong name, we're gonna use the wrong word. I have done that, even as a trans person, I have misgendered people, I've said the wrong name, I've gotten the words wrong because I can't keep up with everything. And the reason that's the case is because humanity is always evolving and it should, right? And language needs to be kind of like tracking along behind it, hopefully updating as we go. And it's our responsibility to keep updating and keep learning as we do. Um, I, I think that one of, the, one of the biggest pushbacks I hear from people about language, oh, that's just a made up word. All words are made up. <laughs> you know what, we make up every single word we've ever said, right, and we use them to communicate, and we should keep updating those made up words to be as comprehensive as they possibly can. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the how I think I approach these conversations. The other thing I think that brings me patience is the reminder that I too once learned, right? I too at one point did not know the word transgender. I too also stumbled between, wait, is a trans man that, is a trans woman this, like I couldn't get them straight either. Um, and I think that was, uh, I, I always remember that when I talk to others. The thing that I start losing patience on is when people won't learn, right? I think it, it, you know, if you didn't know and then you learn, great, right? But if you didn't know and then you won't learn, that's where I think willful ignorance and, and the bigotry um, are bred. So I wanted to ask you a follow-up on that because one of the things that happens though when people do misgender people, whether it's intentional or not, obviously the intentional misgender needs to be called out and resisted and all that, but when you experience right, language that doesn't align with your experience, that feels disrespectful among other things. And so how do you, I'm sure this has happened to you, it's happened to me certainly in different ways, how do you deal with that moment when you're in the moment and regardless of whether or not the misgendering or the, 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 the language problem is not meant to be disrespectful, but it certainly feels that way. Yeah. You know, so it depends on what mode I'm in. If I'm in an education mode, I'm on stage and I'm, I'm, or I'm doing a training, I think of a lot more practiced patience because I'm not connected to the people that are talking to me, right? I'm not caring deeply about everybody who's going to ask me a question or who has a thought because I don't know them and they don't know me. And so their feedback or, or I'm gonna call it feedback, in how they talk to me isn't about me, it's about them. So I think it's easy for me to put that distance. But in interpersonal relationships, it's far more difficult. And I, I try to hold a lot of space for the fact that I might feel invalidated and disrespected and have that be true, while it also can be true that that person didn't know better. And I think then it's an opportunity for me to see to how, how will they respond, right? Will they respond positively when I say, hey, this is what I need, or hey, that didn't work for me, can you go you know, figure it out? Um, that's a really good data point for me to actually understand, are they gonna show up or are they gonna buckle down? There are many things that I felt and experienced reading this book. One was just a reminder, again, of your generosity. You're an incredibly generous person. You extend grace and embody grace in ways that um, I think are uncommon. Yeah, right. I just wanna say that. Um, the other thing, though, that I'm, I'm interested in is that you, are also capacious and generous in terms of imagining an audience for this book. So this book, there are times where you are clearly talking to trans people and queer people. And then there are other times where you're talking to the woman in the purple scarf who couldn't find the word for ally. 
and these other folks who are stumbling into this situation and feeling uncomfortable, and then you know they're somewhere down the road. So as a writer, I want to talk to you about a writer. This is your, I think this is your first book, right? This is your, no, it's not your first book. First, first nonfiction. Second, first nonfiction book, that's right, that's right, second book. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, but as a writer, and all writers, all communicators, have to think about audience. And so you're, you're pitching this and speaking to and appealing to a really capacious, heterogeneous, multifaceted audience. How do you keep that? in balance, or how do you navigate that, when clearly you also want to center transgender lives and lived experiences? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm smiling as you're talking because it was very hard. <laughs> um, I think that the first draft would not tell you that I did a great job of balancing the different audiences. I think, you know, I had, I had many beta readers, my, my wife and my parents, uh, primary beta readers who were like, who are you writing this for, right? Who is this for? Because it's all over the place. <laughs> um, so I, I, I definitely wanted it to be for most people. And most people includes most cis people, most trans people, most people who don't know who they are yet. Um, I wanted it to be for most people, but finding that person I was speaking to, I was writing, uh, was difficult. And um, I, I think that what I ended up trying to do was, was balance where there are moments that were, like you said, speaking directly for my trans readers blank um, and for my cis readers blank. I think I tried to call people into those moments, but I really also tried to think about, is this useful for everybody to read? Because I hoped that the parts that I wrote, you know, for example, for cis readers or for trans readers were actually helpful for everybody because we all need to self-advocate in some moments in ways that we could learn, okay, this is what cis people need to know. I'm a trans person, I'm reading this, I can then tell my cis people this, right? And similarly, if we're reading um, for being an ally to our kiddo or to our friend, if we're reading for the trans people, maybe that helps us be better friends to our trans friends. So I, I tried to pull it all in and hopefully I succeeded. Yeah. And how do you, with respect to the ally, folks outside of, of, of the trans and queer lived experience, how do you get people to move from, obviously you want to move them from a place of hate or misunderstanding or what have you, but when they get to the place of sympathy, right, how do you move them to empathy and solidarity? So that allyship is not surface or performative, it's actually substantive and ongoing. Yeah, that may, if we could solve that problem, I, I think was we say. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you all are evidence, first of all, of some action and therefore solidarity. So I'm, I'm so grateful that you all are here and, and just excited that you engaged uh, with this work. Um, moving people from, I think, apathy or hatred to sympathy, empathy, and action um, is difficult because I think a lot of people see trans people as over there, right? Oh, poor trans, trans people, oh, they're getting attacked, even if they're an ally. Right? Oh, you, know, you have all those problems. Oh, it must be so hard for you over there, right? And what I really wanted to do through this book, which is also why I tried to balance the audiences so much, uh, was a reminder that actually all of us have experience with gender, right? All of you all here, regardless of whether or not you're trans, you also have an experience with gender, and therefore you also all also been limited by your experience with gender, right? Even if you're not trans, you've probably felt either too manly or too womanly, too feminine, too masculine, not feminine, not masculine, what have you, right? We've all been limited by these very rigid gender boxes that's rooted in a gender binary that's very transphobic, right? So in some ways, we've all been affected by transphobia. So I think we actually move the needle by reminding ourselves of that common humanity that we all should be fighting for. Right, right, I love that. Um, one of the things that you do so well in this book, and it's such an accessible book, it really doesn't bite, invite the reader in to, to contemplate this and go on this journey with you. But one of the things you're very generous about, and, and, and it seems sort of intentional about, is sharing stories, right? You, just the introduction has several stories, vignettes of encounters with people who are in different places in different ways. And you do a lot of that, and it gives texture to and richness to, the, to what you're trying to do. This isn't just a how-to guide, right? This is a, this is a journey, and, and as a result, it has stories. You, though, choose which stories you tell. Some of what you share here is very personal and it's very painful and it involves struggle and even trauma and the journey through that. And then other stories are funny and they're you know, empowered and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're all over the place in that way, in a good way. And so I'm wondering, how do you, as a, again, as a writer, but also as a person who is a public person, I'm talking about that backstage, the, the pressures and burdens of that, how do you, as a public person and a writer, figure out which stories you share so that that vulnerability that leads to courageousness can come out, but you also are taking care of yourself? 
I think that's something that I've, I've struggled with um, over the years, and I think I, I used to think, oh, I just, I don't mind, you know, sharing and sort of divulging these things because I was so excited to be able to have these stories to tell, right? Um, especially in my journey in transness, people were like, how did you share your top surgery so vulnerably? How did you share about your testosterone and, and your, you know, your transition so publicly? And I was like, I am so excited by this process. Like, why wouldn't I share it? Um, and I think that was part of my process. It's been a long time since that was one of those moments. That was eight years ago, and I think for me, I've really learned the value of privacy. Um, sometimes, uh, because I did the wrong thing and I shared, the, I shared too much and felt really vulnerable in a way that wasn't empowered. Um, and I and I learned over time that there are pieces I have to keep for myself. And some of those pieces don't have to be meaningful, right, to other people. It could be, you know, what I do on a Sunday afternoon that's boring that I just don't share. So if you, if you are a longtime follower, I don't know if any, any followers from back when I was here at Harvard, I shared pretty much every single day a story or something that happened to me. Now I share very little about my daily life online. It took me nine months to even mention that I'm married um, and, to, and to share my wife with, with my world. Um, and I did that with a lot of intention because I really wanted to keep my life to myself. And even now, I don't share too much about Sarah and about our life together because I want my life to be mine sometimes. Yeah, my husband often says, keep my name out of your mouth when you're out there. Uh, whoops. <laughs> uh, anyway, with all the love that I'm trapped in, of course. Um, <laughs> but what, you know, you're back at Harvard, which is a place of, of important growth and transformation, transition for you. And I'm wondering, this book clearly marks you know, a, a passage of time and growth and so forth since you left here. So what's it? Who's the styler that's coming back to this place to launch this tour? You didn't tell me you were gonna ask me this question, are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, I think, when I think about being 19, which is when all of this started, um, I did feel, I think, mature at the time. I knew a lot more about myself, I think, than a lot of my peers did because I'd been in therapy for, uh, residential therapy for five months prior. I had really thought about who I was for a long time in a way that I think we're not asked to do, we should be, by the way, but we're not, um, unless we go through the experiences that I did. And I, I started with a lot of that maturity, but there's a, there's a lot of the emotional maturity that I didn't have at the same time, and a lot of the experiences I felt very new and green on. I mean, I had never been on a men's team before, and then I started on the men's team in a college D1 team here, and, and it was hard, you know? Um, so I, what I hope is that I'm a more honest version of myself, not that I ever lied back then, but there was so much that I was working through to be able to be present at the time that I didn't think, I don't think I allowed myself a lot of the difficulties that were there. Um, and in writing this book, one of the things that I did, probably the most painful things I did, was I went back and I wrote, read my journals. Um, I was a very avid journaler, still am, but not quite as much, and I, I would write everything down when I was, when I was in college. Um, and sometimes I journal like from midnight until three in the morning, because it was part of how I processed. And I went back and read some of these, these moments and they were, they were very painful to read. And I, I don't think I got how painful they were at the time, you know? And, and there's a specific moment that I talk about in the book, but um, all of my classmates essentially pushed me out of the, the living group that we were supposed to be living together with. Um, and you'll have to read to get the full color of that moment. Um, but it was really hard and, and I, I felt like quitting. I felt like leaving, I felt like not existing. And the journal entry just has all of these words that I was thinking about myself outcast, weird, horrible, never gonna belong. And, and I, I sobbed reading this now because I think the perspective now versus then is so much, I have much more compassion for myself. Um, so I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there's an honesty I hope that, I'm, that I have that I think helps me examine more of my flaws, um, helps me dive a little bit deeper into the pain that I didn't heal because I didn't make the time for. Um, and hopefully I think because of all those things, I'm more engaged with my community to be able to be a better, um, I don't want to say representative, but a better um, part of my community. Um, so you mentioned earlier on all of these bills. Um, Dory mentioned them as well. And I have actually a, a bill tracker where I keep track of the bills and pieces of legislation that are being proposed and passed. And that number, of, alas, it never goes down. And these are bills that are all over the place. Let's talk about a mess. These people are a mess. Um, there are you know, book bans and curricular constraints and bathroom bills and don't say gay this and anti-drag bills and not letting trans athletes play sports and not letting trans people go to the bathroom where they want to go to the bathroom. All of these things. It's just endless and it's unrelenting. 
So we're living in a treacherous political environment in the United States and elsewhere as well, but here in the US for sure. And trans people in particular, transgender people, are in the crosshairs of the culture war. And so I wanted to ask you a, a two-part question about politics. The first part of the question is, why do you think this moment comes with such an anti-trans and anti-queer and anti-many things um, fever pitch? What is it about trans people in particular that causes so much stuff? And then I have a second question. OK, well, wait, because I'm going to forget it. Um, OK, so why trans people? I, I've thought about this a lot. And there's a, there's a, a money reason to some degree that you know, the um, anti-marriage equality had a, lot of, had a lot of money, and they didn't know what to do with it when marriage equality passed. And so this is, I think it's very clearly funneled into this. That's like a financial question that I think is important, right? Because they are very well funded. Right? So that's, that's important to re recognize. But the other real reason, in my opinion, is something I, I, I've sort of come up with a framework, which is that trans people are an excellent scapegoat, an excellent target, an excellent victim of dividing the community. Because everybody is, is actually rallying around these cries that are kind of central and universal. For example, protect women. Right? We can all agree that we should protect women. Protect children. We can all agree we can protect children. Even protect women's sports. We can all agree that we should do that. But these rallying cries have become signals for anti-trans rhetoric and really removal of body autonomy right, and control of people who are marginalized. And actually everybody, but we'll get to that. My point is that it plays on a very base fear, right? Love, you love something that you want to protect, and so you're fearful of, of the harm that could come to that, and then you're motivated to do something that protects that. And so the Republicans and the anti-trans politicians have figured this out, and they, they, they aced it, right? They're excellent at this. They say, okay, you want to protect women? Great. Well, trans women threaten women. Therefore, we should ban trans women. Boom. Easy. Right? And so they're playing on the American public's very base, very valid fears to protect marginalized individuals, right? And at-risk individuals, women and children being primary categories of that. And the problem is that arguing with them, they've figured out how to then make it seem like you're arguing against protecting women and arguing against protecting children when we're not. Because the actual, that, that fear that they're using to stoke it, trans women being a threat or you know, gender from care being some sort of threat, those are false completely made up, right? Their lives, no science supports those things. But that doesn't matter because the fear is already taken hold. So why trans people? An easy target to be able to galvanize all of this hatred that really actually throws votes towards control, right? And power. And not control and power to women and children, but rather rich white men, right? right? Who are not trans, of course. Yeah, because I'm saying at the same time they're, they're attacking trans people. They're also roll back in, rolling back women's rights. They're not protecting LGBTQ children at all, right? There's, and so it, the, the hypocrisy of the whole thing. Well, in the, in the same bills, right, the, the four, 501 right now, anti-trans, anti-queer bills, are written by like the same nine politicians yeah. that are also writing anti-black bills, right? They're banning CRT, they're uh, censoring Black History Month, they're uh, adding voter restrictions specifically to attack black voting rights, right? They're rolling back reproductive justice. All of these things are happening at the same, yeah, exactly, at the same time. And if we miss that, we miss everything. Right, got to connect those dots. Thank you for that. So my second question about politics is how do we beat them and win? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I think we can start by reading the book. <laughs> by the book. A shameless self plug. Uh, and then no. get the book. No, <laughs> but, 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 but really, yes, you can use <laughs> No violence. No violence. Read um, the book. I wrote the book because I, I really do believe that if we can get people more context, there's, there's a chance that we can win. Because what's happening right now is people have, again, their, their base fear and love that's fueling this, this transphobic action. But if we can give them in the middle, instead of a fear of trans women are a threat or trans people are a threat, and give them facts, trans people don't threaten anything, right? In fact, censoring and banning trans people threatens everything, then maybe we can actually come to a different conclusion. But I do think it's gonna take a lot of people engaging with educational material, with trans stories, with trans authors, with community to understand and really humanize these stories. Because otherwise, we're a statistic in the other room, right? And we're so much a statistic that they're using it in comments against me. The amount of times in my comments people say, oh, you know, you're gonna become the 41. What do they mean? 41% of trans people attempt or commit suicide, right? So when they comment on that, they're saying, oh, are you just gonna kill yourself? So we need to understand right, the gravity of these moments and the, and, and the need for all of you all here to step into this fight, especially if you're not trans. 
Because the, the reality is that the people who are gonna buy the book are the people who are going to buy the book, right? What do I mean by that? The people are already somewhat engaged. You can't force somebody to read a book. I guess you could try, but that might not go well, right? And so the people who actually need to read the book are the ones that would never buy it. And so your job, and I think our job as people in any kind of fight is to bring more people into it. And that, again, breeds more empathy into actual solidarity and action. Not to be too lighthearted, but I'm a professor. I force people to buy and read books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> some of the ones here. Uh, anyway, uh, let's open it up for some questions from the audience. And you want to handle this how? Just belt it out? Yeah, you're just going to belt it out. You're going to use your athlete voice or coach voice, and then I'll repeat it, or we'll both repeat it, so that uh, we'll make sure that it can be heard. Yes. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to see, but go ahead, back there. Oh, hello! Hi! I know you. Um, my question is both like vague and personal, but um, I'm curious how you balance wanting to be understood versus not wanting to like make yourself blue in the face constantly explaining yourself to people. Um, that, yeah, at a certain point you have to accept that you can't uh, you can accept every single person. Yeah, so if I can paraphrase, how do you balance the desire to be understood with turning yourself blue in the face in the face of people who won't understand you or can't understand. Is that good? Thank you. I don't know, I'm probably blue in the face quite a bit. You can ask my wife. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think I try to reserve the energy I have to educate for the moments that require it the most. Um, and then I try not to do it elsewhere. So sometimes that means I'm a little too impatient at home, um, and I need to work on that. But I think a lot of it is, where can I put this energy that's most effective? And I talk about this a little bit in the book just to give people tangible skills. But I think that there is a difference between trying really hard to change somebody and knowing how economical to be with your energy to change people, right? So I could use 100 units of energy to change one person who's never going to change or who maybe might change, right? Or I could use one unit on 100 people, right? Each on one unit. That's how math works, right? Yeah, okay, one unit on 100 people. And then I could change those people, right? And then I've got 100 people who are gonna be allies as opposed to one person who like has a 1% chance of being an ally. So I have also, I think, over the years, figured out when's the moment where I'm gonna give up, right? And that's an important moment, and I'm not great at it, I'll be honest. Sometimes I spend 100 units on one person and who knows what happens. But I have to, to really pull myself backwards because I need to be able to use energy when it actually going to make a difference. Great. Other questions here? to those trans folks who might not conform visually or otherwise, and how can a trans person who doesn't conform navigate the world? So you know, I, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Been, this is one I've been asked once or twice, so I've heard the question before. So I think it's a great question, and I think uh, what I want to start with naming is I am somebody who most people perceive as 
as somebody who's conformed, right? I, I, I present in a sort of stereotypically masculine way. Um, I, I dress in a stereotypically masculine way, right? Um, people usually don't have a problem using my pronouns correctly on just on the basis of how I look. They assume that I'm a man and, and, that, and that's that. The reason I'm saying that is because I think all of us need to understand the privilege that we have when we show up in a space, and that is a privilege that I have when I show up in a space. It's also an erasure, right? Because I'm not assumed to be trans, and there's often a moment where I want to disclose that I'm trans because it's an important part of my identity, and people don't assume it from me, and that's always an interesting sort of coming out moment. Now, when we think about the sort of what conformity lends you, there's erasure, and then there's privilege, right? So privilege really means safety. And then if we think of non-conformity, whatever that means, I also, I want to name that saying non-conformity feels also incomprehensive, right? Because the reality is that everybody is a different person and everybody has many different ways of being themselves. But we see sort of societal boxes, right? When we don't fit boxes, I think there's there's a couple main things that I think about being skills to help oneself, which is that for me, authenticity is for me. It's not for other people. And I think we are taught authenticity is sharing yourself with other people. No, that's sharing my authenticity with other people. And there's a difference between me giving my authenticity with people and knowing that my authenticity is mine. So when I talk to people who might struggle a little bit more with how other people perceive them, I want them to prioritize their own authenticity and then they get to decide who they invite into that, right? And I think as allies to folks who might not be conforming for, you know, in whatever way, that's something also to remember. They get to have their own life in their own way and we need to let people express themselves in the ways that they need to and then we can have our own feelings about it, right? That's actually true. If you have a feeling about how somebody dresses, you have that feeling, right? I'm not gonna tell you how not to feel some way about somebody who, you know, you perceive as masculine wearing a dress. If that strikes you as weird, you're allowed to feel that way. Your actions, you should mitigate, right? Just because you feel something doesn't mean you should act a certain way. And I have a, I'm a really big proponent of validating the feeling while also asking you to dissect why that feeling came up, but then not acting based solely on the feeling. Time to check. Okay, 52. Okay. We've got time. time for one more question because I'm going to assume the moderator's privilege and ask you one more question. Okay, okay. So go yes, ahead. let's do it. Hi, I'm Jules. Um, so you told us uh, a few stories about like parts of the writing process that were really difficult and painful for you. Um, Yeah, um, I will say writing this book was hard and it was harder than I expected. And I think part of that is because I procrastinated and I had one month to write it. So <laughs> that was a bit on my, my fault, my fault. Wow, <laughs> um, you broke this in one, one month, okay. I, re I really, like I, July was when I was supposed to start and it was due in October and I started in September, I said that anyways. Okay, so it was very hard to write. <laughs> um, I, don't worry, I went back, we edited it again. It wasn't actually literally only written in a week, in a month. Um, I would say the most joyous parts were actually once I did get it on paper and I felt like my ideas were pseudo-organized, that I could then start organizing what was there. That was a really joyous moment. This is a very like nerdy writer thing, as more than like a trans joy thing. Um, but I think reflecting back actually, in a more semantic sense, reflecting back on how far I had come and how far I've seen people come was really joyous to me. Because I think it's really easy right now to see the world landscape for trans people and think that we're going backwards. And legislatively, we are. I'm not gonna lie, I don't wanna sugarcoat anything, right? we're actively going backwards. We, you know, People do not have rights now that they did um, eight to 10 years ago. So we are going backwards in that sense, but there are so many more allies out there, right? I actually explain the word transgender less these days than I used to. Now sometimes I have to explain it because they'll think they know what it means and they don't. <laughs> Um, but it, there is more allyship than I've ever seen before. And it, it consistently surprises me how ready people are to learn once they're given the opportunity. And I think that goes back to what we do when people get it wrong, what we do when people don't understand. It is very valid to get angry, to feel disrespected, to be upset, and I wanna hold all the space in the world for trans folks who are like, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking done with this shit, right? Excuse my language. Um, all, can I, am I allowed to curse here? Probably. Oh God, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so we, we have to hold that space, right, for those people, and I, I just, I've seen so many people shift that I know it's possible, and I have so much faith that everybody has the capacity to do that shifting, and that brings me so much joy, and honestly, radical trans joy, because in this world, I, 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 there's not a lot of feelings of trans joy that, that I think we would assume that I'd have, but there is joy, and that, that's what makes it radical. Time. We have time for one more. Yes, Mom. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that the people that most need to read this book 
or enough people that are going to go out and buy them. And I already bought a couple copies for those people. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so, thinking, like, how would you quote unquote pitch it to them that they should actually pick up the book? Yeah, how do you make sure that the people, or try to ensure that the people who are not going to buy the book and read the book, read the book. And you have done something subversive and wonderful. You're buying extra copies for some of the people who need to do that. So what would you, yeah. how do you reach them? I, I like this question. It's like, what's the elevator pitch to get the, the, the to be allies in the door, right? Um, I would actually, I don't know if trick is the right word, but I would try to get them to understand that this is actually about them. And what I mean by that is people, again, they think trans people are over there and then nothing's gonna resonate with them. But everybody has felt like they didn't belong. Everybody has felt that they were not enough of something at some point in their lives. Everybody has felt alone at some point in their lives. And I think that in many ways, my experience, because I'm a mixed race, Korean American, queer, transgender man, and athlete, there's something for everybody in there. And, and it's, what I, it's what happens when you're a smorgasbord, right? So I've got a lot of different pieces of me. And, and I want people to see that, right? And, I, and I, my hope is that that's what you can actually pitch it to people as, as a reminder that they too can see themselves in lots of different kinds of people. I'm not sure how much certain people would like that, so that will work for some people. Whatever. I'm, I'm not a trans person, I'm, you can't see me in that. So the next thing is, okay, well, and this is, I, this is a really like a, a, a Hail Mary kind of pitch, but, or throw a baseball pitch, whatever. Um, it's, to, it's to really dive into, hey, okay, well, if you think you know about this, then try reading this to see what you actually know. Right, that's another way to do it. And the last way I would say is if you really want to be anti-trans, great, read the book and come up with points. I, I was, that was a little plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, if people actually want to argue against me, get the points, right? Read the, read the book, get the, research the actual points, and then try to come up with, with, with counterpoints because it's going to be very hard to do so. Oh yeah, I remember when the anti-marriage equality stuff was happening, and I, I just went back and reread the Bible, so that I was like, ready for the show. There are so many great Bible voices. I'm a recovering Catholic queer. Come at me with your Bible. <laughs> you be, be ready, though. Be ready. One of my favorite things to do, and then I'll let you ask your question. On Instagram, when I get hate comments, there mo a lot of the times, I don't want to generalize, but a lot of the times, the people who write the hate comments have a little, like, Psalms 15, 42. Oh, right. um, and so I go and I read whatever the you know Bible verse is, and then I just post it back to them, because usually it's really nice. Right. Right? <laughs> usually the comment is like, love thy neighbor, and don't judge others, and you know whatever else, and they're never actually abiding by their rules. Right, right, right. You get to find Jesus somewhere, and then just repeat that. Um, so I actually have two final questions. One is a, a question that relates to what you were just talking about with radical trans joy, but I want to close with that. I wanted to ask you a question about swimming because you are a swimmer, and swimming was such an important part of your life. It was a place where you found enormous success, which got you to the place where you could be the trailblazer that you are. And it also was a place of solace, some of the most beautiful lines. I was an athlete, I wasn't a swimmer, but I was an athlete too, and the way that you described the like, surface of the water, and the first feeling when you crack the water, and when the boot goes off, right, was really, it moved me. And yet, swimming also was a place of social conflict for you during this particular trans journey. And so I'm wondering, first, do you still swim? And what's your relationship with the water? I would love to, to keep swimming. I don't swim frequently anymore. Um, swimming has been the biggest part of my life for as long as I can remember, and it's, it still is the case, even though I haven't competed for uh, four years, uh, five years. Swimming, I think, was this place of, like you said, solace and conflict, but under the water, it was, it was mostly solace. And I think, actually, in many ways, it was a place I disconnected from my body, which is interesting, because I think sports are where we connect with our bodies in many ways. But swimming was also a place where I didn't have to be a body, where I didn't have to have a gender, where I didn't have to do anything but swim. And it was almost as if I became just the motion of swimming, the act of swimming, as opposed to a person doing the swimming. Swimming is something that I, I crave, that I love. It's one of the places that whenever my therapist asks me, like, what do you need? I always go to thinking of being in the water. Um, and 
the reason I don't swim is because I tore actually overuse injuries. I tore three things in my shoulder and, and swimming just isn't feasible for me right now. Um, and that's a logistical reason. But the other reason is because I, I did actually get tired of looking at a black line for 20 hours a week um, for <laughs> 10 times a, 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 a week as well. Um, and I've actually tried to find, and this is where I think your actual second question comes in about radical trans joy. I tr I've been trying to find different ways to connect with my body. Because I think that while swimming is something I, I will always revere and it will always be a safe place for me to dive into the water, um, there is a complicated relationship to the sport of swimming and to succeeding in swimming. There's a pressure to do it a certain way. And so I've actually become, dare I say it, running, um, which is very hard. I don't know if any of all are runners, but I'm not a runner. Uh, and and it's, it's been this beautiful, though, difficult, painful journey of me trying to embody myself once again. And I think every time we have the opportunity to be embodied, whatever we may do, there's, there's an opportunity to connect with one's body. And I think for me, especially as a trans person who's gone in and out of feeling connected with his body, this is a constant place that I find trans joy. Um, and I, you know, if you see me, if you see like a, a shirtless guy with a big scar across his chest running around, that's me. Because um, I also never wear a shirt. <laughs> because I have, the, I have like fought for so long to be able, right, to be in my body. Um, so the answer to your question is no, I don't swim consistently anymore, but it's exercise and connection with my body that has always remained a constant and I think always will. Yeah. I used to be a runner, now I'm a wobbler. Um, <laughs> can I ask you a question about the translation of radical trans joy in the world? Like you talked about it as a very personal experience, as one that you have had in all these different ways. And, but how does radical trans joy sort of translate and, and flow and liberate everyone? Yeah, so I actually like to think about radical trans joy as revolutionary. And, and the reason is because there are so many forces in the world right now that don't want trans people to feel joy, right? They don't want trans people to exist altogether. And so for me to feel joy, I think that's one of the sort of like the essences of me connecting with myself. Right? In, the, in the intro, I write connection is the essence of humanity. Well, connection is also how I connect with myself is my essence of my own humanity. So I think that that joy that I, that I have felt in looking in the mirror and seeing myself, in going on a run in my shirtless trans body, um, in knowing that so many people don't see me as man, but I see myself as man, in knowing that I have community around me that also sees me as who I am, that accepts me, that embraces me. I think all of these things are actively radical and are a revolution that hopefully all of you all are joining us on. And I think it transcends trans people because it says, hey, anybody can be exactly who they are and still be able to do all the things that they love and still be able to be loved. And I think that to me is really the, the core of, of radical trans joy is that it really is for everybody. So congratulations, it's been an honor to share the stage with you as you launch your book tour for this brilliant and transformative book. Uh, thank you for this, this gift, the gift of tonight, and the gift of your work and you in the world. Um, congratulations. Yeah.